All right, well, on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, for those of you that were wondering, where are we in the church calendar? Well, it's the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. And on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, our Old Testament reading, we've heard the gospel reading, but our Old Testament reading comes from the prophet Jeremiah. And let's get started with that. Let's start with just the first verse. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This morning I want to preach on being exiles in Babylon. In the year 597 B.C., the first wave of Jewish deportees from Judea and Jerusalem arrived in Babylon. This is before the destruction. This is the first wave of exiles. They were forced. It wasn't a choice they made. The, the elite the influential, they were forced by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to relocate a thousand miles away in Babylon. Now, there were prophets among these exiles living in Babylon who were saying our exile in Babylon is going to be short. It's going to be a few months, maybe a year at most. So don't worry about it. Pretty soon we'll be back home. We'll be going back home to Judea. We'll return to our homes in Jerusalem. That's what these prophets were saying. No doubt, you know, trying to be optimistic. They were prophesying according to their hope that it would be short-lived, this exile in Babylon. But the prophet Jeremiah knew this was not the case. The prophet Jeremiah was still in Jerusalem. He did not belong to that first wave of deportees taken away to live in exile in Babylon. And so to correct this misunderstanding of their situation, he wrote them a letter. And let's look at the first part of that letter. It begins in verse 4. Here's the letter. The prophet Jeremiah, in the year 597 B.C., sends to the exiles living in Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. And do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find welfare. So Jeremiah tells them, mm, no, this is not going to be short. Um, you're going to have to learn to live in Babylon. And in fact, uh, he tells them it's going to be 70 years. That's in verse 10. I'd like to read that. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed, will I visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise to bring you back to this place. Wow. 70 years. That's not short. That's a lifetime. So you're 20 years old, you're 30 years old, you're 40 years old, you're 50 years old. You're among those exiles taken away to Babylon. Certain prophets have been saying, don't worry about it, we'll be back home soon. But then Jeremiah the prophet says, no, you're going to be there 70 years. Which means the recipients of that letter realize we're going to live our life here. This is going to be our life now. We are not going home, maybe our children, maybe our grandchildren, but we're not going home. So even though Babylon was not their true home, 
they will have to learn to make Babylon their home for now. And so that's why Jeremiah says, well, do all that is necessary to live meaningful lives. Don't just sit there and do nothing waiting to come home because it's going to be a lifetime. So build houses. Raise families. Even seek the welfare of Babylon where you dwell because in its welfare, you'll have your own well-being. But they have to do all of this without losing their true identity as the covenant people of God. This is tricky. None of this is easy. They've been forced to live in Babylon through no choice of their own. They're going to be there a lifetime. They have to integrate. They have to build homes, participate in the society. They have to raise families. They have to even seek the welfare of the city where they dwell. But do that without turning into a Babylonian, without converting, without losing Yahweh and starting to worship Bel and Marduk and all of the gods of the Babylonians. This is tricky. The Jewish exiles in Babylon had to live in a constant holy tension. They had to think like this. We belong to Babylon, but we don't really belong to Babylon. I mean, they're not, they're not to live in Babylon as like perpetual outsiders. They are to integrate to a certain extent. We belong to Babylon, but we don't really belong to Babylon. We'll live in Babylon and make it our home because we have no choice, but we'll never truly be at home here. We'll seek to be good citizens in Babylon, but we must not compromise our covenant identity. We'll seek the welfare of Babylon, but come on, you can only expect so much of a pagan empire. This is what they're called to, to assimilate, but not totally, to belong to Babylon, but only so far, to live in Babylon, but not become Babylonian. Come on, how many of you see this is tricky? How you pull this off? You're walking a tightrope. You're walking a thin line. Belonging, not belonging. Assimilating, not assimilating. Participating, but not fully. This is what they're called to, and it's not easy. This is the holy tension that Jeremiah called the Jewish exiles in Babylon to embrace. Later, in the book of Daniel, uh, this tension, this holy tension of belonging and not belonging. Here, but not here participating but not fully, is explored more deeply in the book of Daniel. So in Daniel, we see that the Jewish exiles could participate in the public life of Babylon, even holding high office, right? You have have these Jewish exiles who were elite. They were given an elite education, and they were placed in high public office in Babylon. They could do that provided They always kept in mind that they could not compromise their covenant allegiance to Yahweh. So this is this is Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fiery furnace. This is Daniel in the lion's den. They were high ranking Babylonian officials. They were in they were in Babylonian governmental service in high office governors, in fact. And they can do that as long as they understand they can't compromise their covenant identity. And when it, when it comes to it, you're going to say, nah, I can't do that. I will not bow. You can put me in the furnace, but I'm not going to bow to that idol. And you can tell Daniel, no, you cannot pray to your God anymore. He said, no, I'm going to pray to my God. You can throw me to the lion's den if you have to, but I'm going to pray to my God. So that's what the book of Daniel is about. And this holy tension does not end in Jeremiah. It doesn't end in Daniel. This holy tension of living as exiles in Babylon continues into the New Testament. Babylon shows up in the New Testament. Because Babylon is not merely an ancient Near East kingdom of the 7th century BC. 
In the Bible, Babylon is a prophetic archetype of empire. What do I mean by empire? Empires are a little bit different than mere nations. Empires are rich, powerful nations or superpowers, and they got robust economies and they they have a well, they're superpowers. They got big armies and all that. Empires are rich, powerful nations who believe they have a divine right to rule other nations and a manifest destiny to shape history according to their agenda. Now, in the Bible, God is uh, favorable towards nations and the concept of nations with their ethnicity and their diversity and their various language and cultures and all of that. It is empire that God is opposed to. Nations that in their hubris think they shall rise above everything. Because in their claim to have a divine right to rule other nations and a manifest destiny to shape history according to their agenda, the empires of this world claim what God has promised only to his son. Who is the one who has a divine right to rule the nations? Jesus Christ. Who is the one who has a manifest destiny to shape history according to his agenda? Jesus Christ. So empires inevitably try to challenge the sovereignty of God and become idolatrous in nature. And so this is why they're critiqued in the New Testament, most clearly in the, in the book of Revelation. But we also see it in, for example, uh, the epistle of 1 Peter, where in the salutation and the benediction, there are cryptic messages. The letter itself is addressed to the exiles living in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire. Now, these were not literal exiles. They hadn't been plucked up and carried away. They were exiles, listen to me, by virtue of their baptism. These are people that have lived all of their life in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, but they have come to believe that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, Jesus. And they've been baptized. And now, by virtue of their baptism, suddenly their citizenship belongs to someone else, to somewhere else. And so suddenly they now have to learn how to live as exiles in the land of their birth by virtue of their baptism. And then at the end of the letter, the epistle says, she who is in Babylon greets you. Well, the letter is written in Rome. So Rome is the Babylon of the first century. That means the church that's living in Babylon as the current iteration of empire sends you greetings, you new Christians living in the eastern provinces. This is what we need to understand about baptism. It gives us a new citizenship. That's why the apostle Paul and what is it? Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is where? Of heaven. We're here We live here, but our citizenship belongs elsewhere. We're actually foreign exiles living here because our citizenship is of the heaven. Now, the second century epistle to Diognetus explains how Christians simultaneously live as both citizens and exiles. And it's fascinating. So this this is a defense of Christians and Christianity written in the second century, all right, so in the 100s, it's very early in the Christian story. And I'd like to read you a paragraph from the epistle to Diognetus. Christians are no different from other people in terms of their country, language, or customs. Nowhere do they inhabit cities of their own or use strange dialect or live out of the ordinary. They inhabit both Greek and barbarian cities, according to the lot assigned to each. And they show forth the character of their citizenship in a marvelously and admittedly paradoxical way by following local customs in what they wear and what they eat and in the rest of their lives. They live in their respective countries, but only as resident aliens. They participate in all things as citizens and they endure all things as foreigners. Now, this is 
This is an excellent example of how early Christians, informed by apostolic witness and tradition, thought of how they were to live in the world. I find it so instructive that I want to look at this paragraph again by looking at each of the five sentences separately. So in the epistle to Diognetus, trying to explain how Christians live to a wider world in the Roman Empire, the first sentence says this. Christians are no different from other people in terms of their country, language, or customs. That means there's no such thing as a Christian country. Christians rather are sprinkled throughout the world in all kinds of countries. No such thing as a Christian country. There's no such thing as a Christian language. There's no, no Christian language. I mean, Christians, you know, there's most of us here speak English, and then there's people that speak Spanish, and they speak Portuguese, and they speak Chinese. There's no, there's no Christian language, and there's no true Christian culture. Now, 2,000 years on, I get that we've picked up, we've, we've, there's certain things that Christians do around the world that's part of the great tradition, but in general, we simply embrace the wider culture in which we live. Second sentence, nowhere do they inhabit cities of their own use a strange dialect, or live out of the ordinary. In other words, Christians do not aspire to live in a fully separatist society. That's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to live in a fully separate... We're, we're not saying, okay, we're going to go off all by ourselves and have a compound and build a wall and, and we'll just be our own. No. What we are is we are salt and we are light. Throughout the world, some of us, some Christians live in cultures that are more or less friendly toward Christian presence. Others live in situations and countries and cultures that are hostile to Christian presence. But it's just the way it is. We're not, we're not seeking to be a separatist society. We seek to be salt and light within whatever society we happen to live in. Third sentence, they inhabit both Greek and barbarian cities according to the lot assigned to each. According to the lot, the, to the roll of the dice. Just, it's a matter of chance. And so for a Christian, our national identity falls in the category of a philosophical accidental. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's not integral to our, our ontological being. Who I am is I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Who I am is one of the sons of the living God begotten in Christ. That's who I am. My citizenship, eh. some of us are Americans. Some of us are Argentinians. Some of us are Chinese. Some of us are Czechs. It, it just, it's that is not the essence of who we are. Our political, our national citizenship is not integral to who we really are. It's just a matter of the roll of the dice where we ended up. Our true identity is in Christ. Fourth sentence. And they show forth the character of their citizenship in a marvelously and admittedly paradoxical way by following local customs and what they wear and what they eat and in the rest of their lives. So there is no particular Christian dress. There is no particular Christian diet. Many religions, many religions, most of the major religions have some sort of dietary laws. Christianity doesn't. Hallelujah. It's a good part of being a Christian. Whatever you want. We don't, we don't have dietary laws. We don't have, I mean, there isn't a Christian dress per se. So, you know, Indian Christians dress like they do in India. Nigerian Christians dress like they do in Nigeria. American Christians, well, pastors wear leather jackets. Amen. Some do anyway. <laughs> yes, I got an applause for that. All right. We, we're simply salt and light within a wider culture. Fifth sentence. This is, the, this is the most important one. They live in their prospective countries, but only as resident aliens. 
only as, how many of you are a, how many of you were born in the United States and this has been your country your entire life? Well, a whole bunch of Americans there. <laughs> Can you think of yourself as a resident alien? Can you think of, I, I know I was born here and this is where I lived all my life. I've always been a citizen of America, but in fact, even though I was born here and lived here all my life, I am in fact a resident alien because I belong to something other. I belong to another king. They live in their respective countries, but only as resident aliens. They participate in all things as citizens and they endure all things as foreigners. That's that holy tension. And I began this sermon by, by presenting the example of the Jews living as exiles in Babylon. And I told you right up front, it's tricky. It's not easy to get this straight, to get this right, but what's what we're called to. So in the nation of our worldly citizenship, we are resident aliens because our true citizenship is of heaven. Whether your citizenship is of the United States or Russia or, you know, we can just go through and name the 200 and some nations. I'm just picking them out at random. That is not our true identity. That's given to us by lot. That's an accidental. And we have to learn to live as resident aliens. I live here, but it's not truly my home. We are, in fact, to bring in the Apostle, the Apostle Paul's great metaphor, we are ambassadors of Christ. Where is that? That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are ambassadors of Christ. We represent the kingdom of Christ in the nation in which we live. You understand how, how ambassadorship works. Jane Hartley. She's the ambassador, the American ambassador to the United Kingdom. She's an American, but she lives in London. She's living out her life in London. So she's surrounded by British culture, but she's not British. She is an American ambassador in the United Kingdom. That's Jane Hartley. You, you, my friends, you are an ambassador of Christ living in the United States. Amen. The United States is not your true identity, even if you've lived here all your life. Your baptism has made you an exile. Your, your, your baptism has made you a resident alien. And, but if you want to make it more lofty, we'll use Paul's name. Your, your baptism has made you an ambassador. You live here, you participate, you know the culture well, you speak the language and all of that, but you really are representing the kingdom of the heavens where Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. So when we can, we participate in the life of Babylon as citizens. And when we must, we suffer as those who belong to another kingdom because suffering is part of what it means to be a Christian. I don't know if you like that, but it's true. And if you don't enter into the life of following Christ, knowing that suffering is expected to be a part of your discipleship, then you will either be scandalized when you're called upon to suffer in some degree as being a Christian, or you'll simply abandon it altogether and compromise. Christians should expect that because we truly belong to another kingdom, the kingdom of heavens, we never fully fit in here, and that will from time to time result in some sort of inconvenience, discomfort, possibly even suffering. All right, I want to look at one other passage of Scripture, this time from the New Testament. It's in the book of Hebrews, towards the end of the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. For here we have no lasting city. We are looking for the city that is to come. Jesus suffered outside the city. His crucifixion at Golgotha was outside the city walls, outside the city gate, 
writer of Hebrews is working with this as a metaphor. So Jesus, Jesus doesn't come, listen carefully, Jesus doesn't come to save the world as it is. He comes to save the world, but not as it is. He doesn't come to perpetuate the world as it is. He comes to, to bring something other. So Jesus doesn't save Jerusalem as, as it is. Indeed, 40 years later, it's destroyed. Jesus, in fact, is coming to establish the possibility of a new Jerusalem. So Jesus suffers outside the city. And if we're not, if we're not really formed properly in Christian faith, we think, well, yes, Jesus suffered for us. And we'll just stand and applaud. Jesus, I give you a standing ovation. You suffered for me. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Thank you, Jesus. That was awesome. But that's not where it ends. The writer of Hebrews says, now let's go out and join him. Well, let's read it again. So I'm not, I'm not making this up. Therefore, Jesus also suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. So let's not put our faith in any of the cities, nations of this world. Let's rather go out to Jesus, this outpost of the emerging kingdom of Christ, willing to suffer what we must to be faithful to Christ. For in this present age, we have no lasting city, no lasting nation, no lasting empire. Now, empires, they, they traffic in the propaganda of the, of the eternal all the time. They tell themselves and their constituents, you know, we're going to be here forever. I mean, indeed, Rome called itself the eternal city. But the Roman Empire fell. It was not the eternal city. And the American empire in due time will fall, as will all of the iterations of Babylon. Here we have no lasting city. When we tie our Christian faith and our Christian hope to any particular nation, we compromise our faith and misplace our hope. Why? For here we have no lasting city. Every city, every nationality, all that, it is transitory. It's temporary. It comes and it goes. It rises and it falls. It's not where we've pledged our allegiance. We seek the welfare of the Babylon to which we are allotted to dwell. We're, we're to seek the welfare of the Babylon in which we are allotted to dwell. For us, it's America. By the way, we do that best. How do we, how do we seek the welfare of the city, in, uh, the city in which we do. We do this best by loving God with all of our heart and thus praying for the city and loving our neighbor as ourself and establish, establishing neighborliness as a dominant ethic. That's how we best seek the welfare of our own Babylon. But in the end, we can only expect so much out of Babylon. We certainly cannot expect it to become the kingdom of Christ. If you expect any of the empires or nations of this world to actually become the kingdom of God, you will be disappointed. Or worse, you will, you will then be on a trajectory where you compromise way too much. So all of our faith and all of our allegiance are pledged to our Lord Jesus Christ and all of our hope is in the promise of the kingdom to come. And in the meantime, in the meantime we are... Exiles in Babylon, living as ambassadors of Christ. So let us remember Christ alone is the Savior of the world, and our chief calling is to be a faithful witness to our Lord. Amen and amen. Stand up with me. Let's prepare ourselves now to come to the table of the Lord. Hallelujah. Join with me in confessing. You exiles, you, you resident aliens, join with me in confessing the core of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let's confess our sins and receive the Lord's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Amen.